Hiya, I'm Bruce Fumi. If I were to tell you about Canada's greatest ever war hero, would you know he'd be Scottish? If you want to hear about Canada's most decorated Scottish war hero, then this is the video for you. If you like stories from Scottish history, hit the subscribe button at the bottom right and click the notification bell to make sure that they tell you when I bring out new videos. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. Today I've brought you to Cawdor in Nairnshire. Now some of you might have been to visit Cawdor Castle at some point and if you haven't then it's definitely worth a trip if you're up here in the north of Scotland. Now Cawdor seems like an unassuming little village. You wouldn't necessarily think that this would be the home of Canada's greatest ever war hero. But then again, he was every bit as unassuming as his place of birth. McGregor, the name in the clan that was banned at one point. Now, I'm making a video about that shortly and as always, there'll be a link at the end. Obviously, this is a long way from McGregor country and today's character isn't at all like his namesake, Rob Roy. John McGregor was born on the 11th of February 1889 and grew up even more remote than Cawdor on a croft here at Newlands of Urchene. Now, After school he apprenticed as a carpenter and a stonemason but when he was 18 his dad died and as the new man of the house the lease of the croft would pass to him. But John wasn't keen on the idea of doffing his cap to the local laird. Maybe he was a McGregor after all. And that's when he decided to set off across the Atlantic to Canada, which at the time was still a self-governing dominion within the British Empire. Basically, we still owned them till 1982. Now, I don't know about you, but I always wished that I had a proper trade, a skill that was transportable everywhere you went in the world. John McGregor did. And he started off working his way west, picking up work as a carpenter. But he picked up other work too, including as a cowboy. Ultimately, he was drawn to the wide open spaces of British Columbia, where in 1913 he set out by canoe up the Skeena River. I can only imagine the exhilaration of living in contact with nature in those beautiful, remote, idyllic Canadian wilds. He'd never want to leave. Living as a trapper in his lonely mountain cabin, he was so remote that a year later, when a passing ranger dropped the bombshell news that Britain and Canada had gone to war with Germany, World War I had already been going for six months. Straight away, John packed up his tools and left a note on the door so that passing grizzly bears would know that he was off to war. He put on his snowshoes and stepped into the winter, heading for the town of Terrace, which had the nearest railway station. He set off with food for seven days. Now, let's not underestimate this. If he didn't manage to tramp through wilderness, wilds and snow to get there in seven days, then he'd be stuck without supplies in the wilds of a Canadian winter. It took him five days. This is his local train station back in Nairn. But when he arrived by train at his adopted home of Prince Rupert to sign up, they didn't look at him twice. They just smelt him once and said he wasn't fit for the Canadian Army. So he got on a boat to Vancouver, during which he transformed himself from a mountain man into a citizen sufficiently presentable to be meaninglessly mowed down by machine gun fire in the Belgian mud. He was now 116031 Private John McGregor of the 11th Canadian Mounted Rifles. Now there's way too much to tell you in the wartime exploits of this incredible Scottish Canadian. So I'm going to limit myself to three events. At the Battle of the Somme, he was promoted straight from private to sergeant because that's how quickly folk were being killed. He was part of the 2nd Canadian Division at Vimy Ridge. Now, the Scots watching may not have heard of Vimy Ridge. The Americans, Australians and Kiwis may not have heard of Vimy Ridge. The Canadians, they've heard of Vimy Ridge. On the 8th of April 1917, as covering barrage was laid down, John had to lead his company uphill across 700 yards of defensive positions 
capture the main German trench, then reverse those trench defences to face the new German front. Shouting, what are we waiting for? John jumped up out of the trench and led his men zigzagging through enemy fire, zipping bullets and exploding grenades. Their only saving grace being that wind and sleep that day made it difficult for sniper fire. As they got nearer to their target, a machine gun opened up on them. Getting his platoon to lay low, Jock himself charged the machine gun nest, killed the crew and captured the gun, and then forward to the objective, where the German defenders dropped their weapons as he demanded their surrender. In that 30 minutes of hell, in addition to thousands of men, almost a third of the officers were killed or wounded. Recently promoted Sergeant John McGregor was promoted in the field to temporary lieutenant and awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal. Short of a Victoria Cross, it's the highest gallantry medal that can be awarded to a non-commissioned officer. I'm proud to say that my granddad, Harry Sharp, was awarded that same medal in that same war. I mention him in my video about the Black Watch. Eight months later, twice in one day, John led reconnaissance patrols into no man's land in order to gain intelligence for a raid planned for a fortnight's time. He and 23 of his men set out in ones and twos so as not to alert suspicion. But when they'd all reassembled in a shell hole, they were discovered and bombs and rifle fire came booming and whizzing into the shell hole with them. Jock changed the plan and he took his company forward to a different part of the line. They laid bath mats over barbed wire and burst through to the German trenches, attacking a machine gunner, then bayonet in the trench defenders. They captured two and took them back to their own lines. Jock was awarded the Military Cross and promoted to captain. Now in World War I, 51 Victoria Crosses were awarded to Canadians. 30 of them were posthumous. What I'm saying is that to be awarded a Victoria Cross, you more than likely had to die in the process. Nine months after the incident I've just described, where Jock was awarded the first of his two military crosses, he and the men of the 3rd Canadian Division were given the job of making it across miles of deep mud barbed wire and open ground with poor quality maps and no supporting artillery barrage to capture the high ground over the Sonsi Valley. The odds were horrendous. The rate of losses would be worse than the Somme, Vimy Ridge or Passchendaele. Attacks on the 28th of September ended in failure with many Canadians cut to pieces by machine guns. And so the next day reinforcements were brought up in the first 30 minutes, John C Company was involved in heavy fighting, but they managed to capture five machine gun nests, one of which John had dealt with single-handedly. Then they were outflanked on the left, and for the first time in the history of the regiment, the men refused to go forward. John grabbed the rifle and rushed into the open himself. By the time he reached the enemy position, he had bullet holes in his tunic and a wounded knee. He single-handedly killed four, captured eight, and then went back for his men. At which point he found out that all the officers of D&B Company were dead. He took the command of the men, all of the men, and he led them forward. He continued the battle for 36 hours, using a shillelagh as a walking stick to compensate for his wounded knee. By the 30th of September, they were still trying to seize the bridges over the canal. John did a personal recce and found the town partly vacated, so he moved his men forward. They reached the dock, where in spite of continual messages to headquarters for three days, they were pounded by their own artillery. So it wasn't the Germans that stopped their advance, it was their own side. John McGregor, DCM, MC, survived, and he was awarded the Victoria Cross. At the start, I told you that John McGregor was as unassuming as his little hometown of Cawdor. 
When he finally got back to his log cabin, he found the doors off their hinges, but his tools were still there. He went back to carpentry, settled down, married, had a family, and made no boast of his heroic wartime efforts. Although he performed acts of heroism and compassion in civilian life that there's just no time to cover here. By the time 1939 came along and Canada declared war on Hitler's Germany, the Canadian Army had little need for 50-year-old retired Majors and Army Reserve units, and Major John McGregor was not called upon for active service. Now let me know in the comments section below, if you were 50 and comfortably at home on another continent in the reserves, would you volunteer to go and fight Hitler? Just say Hitler or home in the comment section. So what about Jock McGregor? Well, much like in the previous war, having faced rejection in one town, he took the ferry across to Victoria and on the 20th of June 1940, an application to join the Canadian Active Service Force as private, signed not by Major Jock McGregor, but by one John McGregor Major. The story goes that at one parade, the general came round to inspect the troops. And as he passed, a middle-aged man in the second rank, with a bit of a paunch compared to the younger men, he said, that man in my office. Oh. The company sergeant major then spent several minutes swelling into a beetroot like apoplectic rage, berating this slovenly individual about his condition, his uniform, his deportment, and the fact that he was a disgrace not only to the unit, but to the whole Canadian army. He then marched him into the General's office and stood him at attention in front of the General. The General said, You may not recognise this man, but he's Major Jock McGregor, VC, MC and Bar DCM, and I'm appointing him your new company commander. <laughs> what a redder! So in August 1943, John McGregor found himself again in Europe where he managed to get some time with his eldest son. The lad was a Royal Canadian Air Force pilot officer and a rear gunner in bombers who'd been awarded a distinguished flying cross, a chip off the old block. They managed to travel here to Nairn together where Dad showed the young lad his roots. Now that's not the end of Jock McGregor's story. More stuff happened to him when he returned to his adopted home of Canada. But I think that here in Nairn, Beside the memorial raised to him, seems like a good place to end for now. Coming up on the screen, there'll be a link to another McGregor, Rob Roy, and to the story of where the McGregor clan was outlawed. Oh, incidentally, if you'd like a groovy mug or a t-shirt like mine, there's a link to my shop in the description below and the white tab up there. In the meantime, how many dogs can be a lamb alive? Cheerio and drastic.